everybody. My name is Samantha Zessi. My name is Roy George Schultz. Be first. And this is Masculinity. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. Like, I don't know if you remember, but when we were talking to our good friend Eric Bussey from uh, Scouts for Equality, we talked to you quickly about like American nostalgia. And if there's any king of American nostalgia, king, prince, it's me. Uh, I'm always looking backwards, rose tinted, hipster glasses always. And for some reason this morning, I saw Boy Meets World was on. And I was like, Topanga, what's up? And it was the series finale. And I was like, oh, I definitely got to watch this. And I was expecting it to be horrible, but it wasn't. It was so good, and it hit all the right nostalgia chords, just strumming hard. I was just back into it. And yeah, Topanga Lawrence, like, girl, you bad. (laughs) Like, when I was in high school, my first locker I ever got, like, I was so proud because I printed out on my mom's, like, desktop printer a picture of Topanga Lawrence, cut it out with some kitchen scissors, taped it on that locker uh, door, and every time I opened my, like, freshman locker, there was Topanga <laughs> Amazing. That's, like, so quintessentially American, what you just described. Like, that's something that, you know. I'm the most quintessential American <clears throat> there is. Right. I mean, I'm evidently around. so. Continue. That was it. Oh, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so what I watched, actually, this week was, have you seen Chris Rock's Tambourine yet? Yeah, they shot that at BAM. Uh, oh. I started watching it and I was like, I don't really care. And I turned. I don't think I like stand up comedy that much. Oh, I, see, I love stand up, and I mean, I love stand up and I love Chris Rock. But you know, there's something. I think there's something new in the way that I'm seeing things these days because I was like, Chris Rock, why are you so old school? Like he was saying all this stuff about like you know the way that men and women act fine. Like I'm expecting. I don't know. I think he's supposed to be like his late forties. I'm expecting that kind of talk. Actually, for most people, no matter what your age are is right, but. He said shit like, oh, uh, you know, men don't really own their homes, you know? Like, the minute you marry somebody, you got to know that she's going to take the house if you, if she leaves you. Or if you leave her, no matter what. Like, that house is not yours. It's not yours. You know? And I was like, I'm sure part of that is true in the legal system. Like, I feel like, you know, in terms of, like, definitely marriage and parenting. It's funny to women see are Chappelle and Rocks, like, bits have become old hat in like less than a decade right like a new culture that is the millennial culture that gets shat on for being millennials and blah 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 blah. we're we're i don't know privileged and whatever yet your old like shtick of being an angry man just kind of doesn't work anymore sorry right and you know what was funny about that is like he's like talking about his kids or whatever being in um like like, he's talking about, like, his as- assembly for his kid's school. He goes there, and, like, teacher goes up and is like, you can be anything you want. He's, like, making this joke about how, like, he sees at least 60 Uber drivers in the crowd and, like, how you can't lie to these kids. I'm like, homie, you made a living out of being a stand-up comedian. What do you mean you can't be anything that you want to be? Like, what are you talking about? But you know one thing that he did say was that men are only loved if they can provide something. Which, but that's really how he feels. He's, like, talking about his divorce and, like, basically competing with his wife and all of that. And, like, I get, wh- wh- what I want to highlight about that is this, is that, what like, the problematic things that he was sharing up until that moment all became contextualized by this idea that, like, nobody cares about men unless they are performing masculinity in the sense, in, in the way that we want and expect them to. Which... I don't agree with that, obviously, but it's important for that to be highlighted and for to understand that a lot of men feel this way and it dictates the action. And a lot of women feel this way. A lot of people feel this way. So, yeah, I don't I think you're very you're onto something. And I know I feel this way. And I think a lot of men feel this way, that a lot of our value and our self-worth, there is none of it if there's nothing that we can bring to the table. And I think that's a very human issue. But we've so kind of partitioned ourselves off whether it's by gender or whether it's by sexual orientation or whether it's by even like career status like we only offer what we're only worth what we can bring to the table and that's kind of unfortunate because really what we bring to the table is our humanity and we bring that to one another and we bring our experiences to one another 
and we just bring ourselves and that should be enough uh to be worth all the love in the world and all the gratitude in all the world and all the uh hope and then the hope that we bring for shout out to Ramoy with the poetic today i love it um anyway Shout out to Boy Meets World for teaching me to <laughs> hope and to believe. And Mr. Feeney. Oh, Mr. Oh, Feeney, you Mr. taught me Feeney. so many things. Well, what are we going to talk about today? So, I mean, I think we can't really not talk about Parkland. I feel like, you know, since we started this show, unfortunately, you know, we've we've seen a, a, an unreasonable amount of instances of public and private violence and have had that to talk about. And unfortunately, you know, Park Lytton happened recently, and there have been many articles and speeches linking masculinity to the extreme act that is mass shooting. And, uh, you know, given that when the latest, well, I think at this point, we've there's probably been a couple more that we haven't heard of yet, unfortunately, but, you know, the one that's making headlines in Parkland, Florida, at Stoneman Douglas High School, happened on Valentine's Day this year. And at the time that it happened, it was the 18th mass shooting since the beginning of the year. So that's 43 days since the beginning of, since the, beginning of the year. And, had, and it's basically, I mean, that's like more than, help me with math. That's a little, a little less than every other day that there's been um, a mass shooting. So, you know, and, and what's interesting about that is if we look at the profile of the shooters, there's one defining characteristic, right? They're all dudes. And I feel like we're doing our usual thing, right? I mean, actually, it's not very usual because the gun control debate has kind of gone buck wild with, like, arming teachers and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it, it's crazy. But I think that one of the things that's resounding in every single, unfortunately, instance that we are talking about mass shootings is that we're not – we're putting Band-Aids on the bigger issue, which is what drives a human being – to act out in this way, specifically if we know that they're all guys. And you know, when we're talking about school shootings, they're all they're all young guys, right? What drives them to 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 act the way that they do to actually carry out these heinous acts? And we almost always address masculinity or the performance of masculinity in our case as an afterthought. Yeah, I mean you're right, like to us in this this conversation it really seems like that should be at the forefront of discussion like this identification and then this discussion of masculinity one to th- one thing you know to consider is that this violence always feels warranted when it's as a reaction or in revenge in parkland this shooter reportedly decided to open fire in a school leading to 15 deaths because a situation with a girl didn't go the way he wanted. Think about that. Now, everyone has to feel it. If he felt wrong, why wasn't there another way to deal with his pain? And, like, consider that association, his and pain. Masculinity and pain. Consider that. Why wasn't there another way for masculinity, a person utilizing masculinity, being forced-fed masculinity, wearing the mask of masculinity to deal with his pain. Yeah, and I think, you know, I feel like when we when we talk about like mass shootings in general, there's like the sense of like, oh well they're inevitable and like, you know, there's just like How are they inevitable? I don't understand that. I but mean fine. In this case, he, this had been on pe- on people's radar, right? He was like on the FBI's radar, uh, the FBI's radar. You know, there were there were there were in there were public instances and examples of his rage and also foreshadowing the fact that he was planning to make this happen and nobody took it seriously you know and so you know as we talk about like gun control which everybody is obviously thinking about very actively we talk we think about mental health which you know on on one side of the aisle people are always talking about on the other side of the aisle it's like what do you mean mental health would you say right it's not a thing it's like we have to take a look at what, as, as society, we start to we start to respond to, right? I mean, why is it mental health be take, be, being taken seriously? But also, it's like, why can't we, even if it's not mental health, even if it's, I mean, I have various theories about it, right? It's like, there's like this notion of entitlement, right? This girl didn't do what he wanted, or he didn't go out with the girl that he wanted to go out with, or whatever may have happened. So now, everybody has to feel his pain. 
you know, or me you know maybe he was bullied when he was little, and you know, and, and like I've, I've I was bullied when I was little, I was little, and I have had to confront that recently myself. So I know that there are things that need to be attended to, and what what my concern is that is that he did try to speak out, he did try to, and I'm not trying to say that this is like a sympathy thing for him. I'm just saying that. There are things to do here, and we're not doing them, and we're expecting shit to change. I mean, I think this goes, you know, you mentioned that, you know, one side, because there are two major sides here, one side is always talking about mental health and one isn't, and that's a whole another exhaustive conversation about that. But it's this association, again, with, like, kind of masculinity, vulnerability, who's allowed to feel sympathy and allowed sympathy, and you know what brokenness means and a spectrum of feeling and pain and mental health issues and i think at the core of this if you're talking at the core of this main issue being about masculinity and why that's not being addressed why are we not assessing at the core issue of that's this this kind of even deeper cut why are we not talking about how everything isn't black and white how everything isn't binary and how we can't easily sum up an issue, a pain, a problem in one or the other. I, I really, I can't help but feel like, you know, if this, you know, when it's a young woman who's having feelings of, of rejection, of hurt and pain, you know, she knows that she can go and talk to someone. She can talk to her friends. She can talk to her counselor. She can talk to her, you know, mom. I mean, Obviously, this is a gross generalization, but generally, pe- women are encouraged and expected to be able to speak their feelings as long as it doesn't incriminalize a man. As long as it's not incriminalized and actually calling a man to 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 justice about wrong actions, like we saw this year, then it's perfectly fine. There's no backlash, right? Like women speak up about their feelings. That's what women do. What I think is funny here is, and funny because I've. I feel this and I've felt this many times. It's like, so in most cases we were saying that men aren't allowed to be vulnerable or emotional or share their feelings and we kind of have to kind of compartmentalize everything and then compact it down and pretend it's not their right repression, right? But then when we, we understand that, you know, on the opposite side of the binary, like women are allowed to be emotional and we uh, women are allowed to be vulnerable and like kind of be completely carefree with their emotions to a place that is freedom, right? And in a certain way, I can get frustrated about that. I'm like, why do you get to have the ability to just be free and just be la di da and like be feel one emotion one second and feel another emotion another because I have to repress everything and I know this and like I almost have this like uh, like meta awareness about the situation, but I can't do anything about it because. What we always talk about is like these things are so systemized and they're forced upon us that we kind of have to fit these molds. And as a man, you're supposed to you feel obligated societally and pressured to fit this mold of what is masculine, what is repression, what is not being emotive. Right. And knowing that, but then seeing what you can't have just almost exacerbates that frustration. But I wonder, like if at any point in the shooter's mind, like there's also this amplified frustration because of he couldn't get the girl, but he also can't talk about his feelings about being sad about not getting the girl or any of his experiences where he may have felt vulnerable or sad or hurt, but can't talk about it and just being even more frustrated with that. First of all, I just want to backtrack and say that the world is not incriminalized. It's incriminated. I do as a translator feel the need to correct myself. Anyway, um, I, mean, I thought I th- you were using a word I didn't know. I was like, <laughs> cool, you're smarter than me. You should have just gone with it. I don't know. <laughs> I just feel like if we're going to be talking about compassion, we're going to need to address the fact that there is strength and vulnerability in everybody and that when there are signs that we address them and address the actual cause, not just the symptom, right? And I feel like really what we're doing here with this gun control situation with you know the 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 way that we're just completely ignoring mental health is putting a band-aid on or trying to put a band-aid on something i mean obviously gun control is necessary i mean like clear but i just feel like the conversation of legislating control 
is not going to go as far as providing support and resources for people in need. Look, these fucking basketball players that I adore or hate named LeBron James, they make a lot of money and have these pr- these associations of hyper-masculinity projected upon them. But we see like DeMar DeRozan tweet one thing at the All-Star game about being depressed and how now Kevin Love's come out and now Kelly Oubre's coming out and these men who were so associated like uh, LeBron James was to just shut up and dribble, like to be just these big in most cases, black men, and just to be what it means to be men, if only one person can come out and open the conversation, we can see it's not just these big, macho, like, hyper-masculine, muscly men. These are people. And we can offer them. They have just as much right to feel sad, have mental health issues, be frustrated, no matter how much money they make, no matter what position of status they are in the world and we can all offer them humanity and they can they can then do the same for each other and refract it back upon ourselves right i mean that's the joy of being in society and it's in the same thing that once we can see examples of like this like we are not men do not have to fit to the to the guards and the roles and the codes of what it just be men and what we've been taught to be men like we can open up and be vulnerable and in a sense vulnerability is a strength like you've always said that encourages others to be vulnerable and like to share in something so profound but yet so almost as a treasure because we've locked it away when that is like the human experience well i mean i guess what i'm really interested to find out is like what exactly does society get out of maintaining the status quo you know it's like i think we're we have to just be it has got to be more than just that we're afraid of change I feel like if people are capable of evolving, then like what, ki- like why keep these help- unhelpful constructs? I mean, I think some people will be like, oh, you know, it's because of the differences in sexes, like male, female, and it's human nature, and you know, this is just the way that we're programmed. And it's like, well, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I have another theory. I, I do think that masculinity, the performance of masculinity, is a profitable machine. I mean, I think that. You know, we saw the NRA, well, I don't think we did see the NRA come out and firstly kind of advocate for, like, keeping these these ridiculous, I mean, in my opinion, ridiculous rules around, like, letting people who are super young buy, buy guns, like, not raising it to 21. It's like, I can buy a gun, but I can't have a glass of wine legally, you know, in this country before the age of 21, which is insane. And I mean... I think that a very, very certain group profits from that. And I think that if we really take a look at it, you know, we, 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 it's always positioned as this kind of like whole shtick of like owning a gun is protection, is, is for protection and recreation. But if we really take a look at who's using guns, who profits from people using guns, I think we'll see that there's like a very clear hierarchical divide. Right. So, I mean, taking a look at a couple of facts, you know, first of all, men are three times as likely to own a gun as women are. And they're more likely to use it for recreational purposes than they are um, for for protection, which I think is kind of I mean, it's not really all that surprising. I mean, it plays right into the gender roles that we've been that we've been taught our whole lives. Right. It's like women need to be protected. So I'm going to use the gun for protection. Men are manly, strong, you know, exciting about. I mean, excited about being able to provide for the family. So, you know, hunting, just target practice, whatever it is, you know, that that kind of feeds into that performance of masculinity is it, right? Like, it'll obviously work. I mean, but one thing that's a staggering statistic, which I didn't know, is that 42% of American households actually have at least one gun in them, which is insane. I mean, that's crazy, but, you know... If we think about the fact that, you know, the gun industry is an $11 billion a year industry, then it starts to make a little sense why we are so invested in, well, not we, but there's a certain sector who happens to have a humongous amount of uh, of um, influence on our legislative body right now who is super invested in making sure that 
America continues to buy and use guns at staggering rates. Look, I grew up in the Texas Panhandle. A lot of my friends now there have guns. Growing up, I was around kids who hunted, and there was that societal pressure uh, to, like, as a man in this area, like, you just want to shoot a gun, right? But what you're, you know, you're putting out and what we're learning is that whether it's the NRA or other groups or people who are who have drive benefits from people owning guns there you know there is kind of this incentive to continue to have very rigid gender roles you know and for the layman who like myself as a kid in texas who just didn't want to shoot a gun my friends did did we know that did we keep that in the back of our minds were we critical thinking about that on that stage no it was like some kids wanted to own guns and some didn't some wanted to hunt some were taught to hunt by their father so then they entail wanted to keep on that tradition and that was a tradition they wanted to pass on to their kids but whether it's those traditions or it's those you know something you as a person just generally desire like there is again an incentive for industries to have rigid gender roles not only to keep like sales in various industries but also to make sure that you know unfortunately and this is not probably the most popular take but make sure that mental health is not a priority and how it keeps the whole system going and going, and it just yields to unprecedented mass incarceration, you know, creating this industrial prison complex that we've discussed recently. And the list goes on and on. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, I I don't have the exact numbers on, like, the amount of profit that the industrial prison complex is generating every day, but I'm most positive that it's definitely in the billions um and i think that you know while our other countries have their own issues and their own gender dynamics that they deal with which are pretty similar to ours but you know definitely uh, upheld with different types of structures um older structures i do think that the united states as a younger country is in a position to make things a little bit better for its citizens but it chooses not to what's funny is like do people realize like america's only been around like less than 300 years like that's crazy and just geographically how big we are and how much we've i hate to use the word evolved but evolved changed grown like in those less than 300 years and to be such like a a quote-unquote melting pot with like ethnic and cultural diversity granted at the loss of the indigenous peoples and the genocide of the indigenous peoples but with all that in mind like just to think about what has happened and what has changed in such a small span versus like what we think of like Western European countries who have been around for almost two millennia in certain ways, like we are a brand new country that's constantly changing and constantly forcing ourselves to change. And we have an incredible society of individuals who are always expecting change and wanting change and self-determining that change. Agreed. And I, and I, I could only hope and believe that that can continue. I mean, it's like, to your point about the fact, I mean, to be honest, when you said 300, I was like, hmm, is it? But really, it actually is less than 300 years old. And to, I think a point that we made, actually, when, when Hudson was here was that, you know, it's all created. I mean, we have the power to create the shit that we want to have our society have in it. And I think that, you know, we have, like, this these, these binary structures or whatever that have been put in place to kind of keep the system going, but I think it's really important to remind ourselves all day, every day, that these systems can be recreated to work for what we want it to work for. And I think, like, I don't know, I just think that a lot of times we think that there's, like, forces beyond our control, and it's, like, important to remember that these elected officials that are doing the things that they're doing are doing those things with are backing because we put them there. But I feel like there are other ways, right, that like there are other industries that exploit gender roles in ways that are deemed so normal and so impregnated in our culture, but again, could just be changed if we chose to change it. I mean, I think if we look at like the mainstream film industry, which, you know, I love my movies, it's, it's, it's a fucking prime example of a sector making huge profit off maintaining gender roles, right? Like movies that make the most money usually include guns and a guy who's the superhero or the hero. And then we wonder, you know, why 
mass shootings happen. And honestly, I mean, looking this up and researching into this like little bit or whatever, I was like thinking to myself, I was like, you know what? Like, let's think about this a little bit. Like, is it really that like when you have a like because like movies where there's a hero who's a man movies like you know so many formulaic hollywood movies right they've been done over and over again right so there's a sense that people know how to do those really well they know how to create a winning formula is it just that movies that have a man as the like the front runner are actually usually better written because or just better and better made because we've done it so long and the answer is no. Rotten Tomatoes, you know, Roger and Eber, whatever, all the people who have like, all the critics who have the, those really trusted reviews, women-led movies and men-led movies are of the same quality. So when we're, ta- when we're thinking about the fact that, you know, men-led movies gross $10 million more in the box office than women-led movies do, my personal take on it is that it has to do with who we qualify as hero and who we qualify as a supporting character. And I think that we trust that the movie is going to be good because the, the dude is on the front page because we're just used to having men as heroes. I mean, I was just at the, t- I mean, you know, you guys will hear this a little bit, but for International Women's Day, I went to a panel with Denai Guerrera, shout out to Okoye, and Reese Witherspoon. Shout out to Okoye. And Wakanda forever. For Wanka- Wakanda for motherfucking ever. And she actually said something that you said when we were talking about um when we were talking about Wakanda. She said that she had heard that a lot of people when they went to see the movie were Like, she said that there was one young man who said something to the effect of, I never thought that women could be generals. And if she, and what I, one of the things that I thought about was, what if she had been the one, like, what if she had been T'Challa, right? Like, what if, if, if there hadn't been the president of Black Panther being a man, which we already know and we already want Shuri to be the next Black Panther, right? But what if it had just started with Shuri? What if it had just started with, let's say, a standalone Okoye movie? We all know that she kicked ass, but would we have been as ready to go see that movie if it had started with her? You know, and I think it it, it has everything to do with who we think of as masculine. It is necessary for more movies to be ha- to have... Uh, men characters right now because we think men are the heroes so where the change starts is us shifting our thinking and starting to understand that women can also be heroes and men can be very effective and amazing supporting characters as well so that we can create a little bit of equality in the mix right because then we can actually start to see a shift in gender roles and understand that the entitlement to women's bodies the lack of support for men is actually just something that we manufactured and it doesn't really have to be this way we have these associations these these really deeply embedded associations with what is a hero what is a leader right and how that is problematic is yes that you know that keeps one we'll say in this case say gender out as the secondary role, right? But it also is unfair to those who are within the primary role but who don't associate with being a leader or a hero and puts them in an unfair position to where that they have to make decisions or be put in an elevated place where they don't want to be or they don't feel comfortable or they are just not in a place to be that leader or hero. And when they're put in that unfair position, that is compromising for them they then themselves as the individuals themselves feel broken feel wrong and feel slighted because we are in such a strict and rigorous codified society of who can be a hero who can be a leader and if we can slowly but efficiently move ourselves out of this kind of binary which you're incredibly talking about which we're kind of seeing happen so rapidly at least in you know in film and in the pop culture that we engage with we can start to see that it's not such a rigorous thing about a man needs to be a hero a man can be a leader a woman is just there to support or a woman is just there to you know worship you know kind of the male hero but anyone man doesn't fuck man fuck women fuck sis like 
Anybody can be a hero if they have the qualities to be the hero. Anybody can be a leader if they possess the abilities and the ambition and the and the wherewithal to be a leader. I want to see anybody who can lead me well lead. I don't give a fuck. And, and this is a perfect segue, actually, because I th- I love what you said about you know the fact that not every man wants to be on the front line. You know, like there are a lot of people actually who can lead from the back of the room or lead from from the from from the audience, you know, and I think that that, you know, just to praise Wakanda a little more, uh, I think that's one thing that forever. I think that's one thing that, you know, in Black Panther, which was so great, was that everybody was united for Wakanda and it and it had everybody understand that they played a part so everybody was important just because you're not Black Panther or T'Challa does not mean that your role is not pivotal to the way that society is gonna go and I think that this is really when we take a look at like like why like why are we even having this conversation right about like how gender roles and like the the performance of masculinity and and expectations of men and women and everyone in between and outside of that directly contribute to this ma- these mass industries that we've created in this country because what ha- what's happened inherently is that there's a, a hierarchical structure That has us, I mean, and this is the theory, you know, a lot of my friends know, I'm always talking about Hunger Games, right? It's like, you've got the 1% at the top, and everybody is fighting for the scraps at the bottom. And there's no sense of unity, because we're all battling each other for upward mobility into this 1% that, let's be honest, just in the past five years, the Federal Reserve has done all kinds of shit to make sure that that's not going to happen, right? I mean... We have people that are, I mean, of course, we've got, you know, like athletes making millions of dollars and stuff now. But anyway, all this to say that, you know, if we really take a look at the ways that we've been structured, the things that we consider masculine, let's take a look. Working really hard, being a provider, being physically strong, bringing the bacon home or, you know, vegan bacon home. There's this like this notion that the masculinity that we've that we've cultivated as a society that what we what we think of as masculine there's like something about it that is like a guy has to be like a hard worker i'm thinking like a blue like blue collar right working with his hands like protecting with his body like all of these things that have to do with like a man's physical ability to do things which if we take a look at who are the most powerful people in society in the sense that they can literally dictate the way that your whole life is going to go by putting things in place, like, I mean, h- how to really put this into words, right? Like, just the system. These guys are behind closed doors. Nobody knows who they are. They're operating at levels that have nothing to do with, like, being the protector and being the provider. They're out for themselves, and they're creating structures to make sure that the whole 99% is working to make them richer, and I feel like that's such a that's that's so separate from the construct of masculinity that we have been nurturing for so long. And I think that as long as we continue to focus on that as a society, then we'll continue to have this like notion of like we need to struggle, we need to work really hard, we need to like provide for our families and beat out the next guy so that we can be on top and make sure that we're okay. It's kind of like notion of like scarcity. And then we don't we won't actually ever attain it i don't know i mean does that make sense yeah i mean i think we humans fall prey to this idea of or not fall prey we we practically employ narrative and in america we've been force-fed through our history through our fucking folklore of like paul bunyan and joseph smith and the colonists whatever like the american struggle and the american dream and blue collar american and you work hard as an immigrant and you come here and you can make something of yourself and that's the narrative we've been force fed and that's the narrative we all subscribe to that's what it is to be american in reality is that's what's really happening are we competing against one another that to attain something that we can you know rightfully claim as ours while you know if few billionaires sit out there and hold all the wealth and all the power and control the controls that keep us away from that maybe 
I think it's more important to understand like how what the narratives are that we adopt, and and this kind of reverts itself back into like masculinity. I mean, the, the masculinity that we're constantly entertaining and we're talking about this mask with a hard K, this this mask that is a like meta, um, a metaphorical mask that we as men put on and individuals universally can put on. It's a narrative. It's a story we keep telling ourselves. It's a story we keep hearing. It's a story we keep interacting with. Again, in the TVs, in the movies, in the sports, like that we watch. Like, and once we can stop, once we can see it as just a story, just a fairy tale, not something that we have to live by, not something that we have to subscribe to as our Bible, as our dogma, as our doctrine, right? It's just a story, and we can change the story. And that's what's the coolest part. We can redefine, repurpose, rewrite this story. And I hope that's what we're doing. And that's what I'm excited about. And like you said, like this American struggle, this American competition for limited amount of resources and limited amount of wealth is the wrong story. I think that these narratives that we keep on telling ourselves and that we keep on, you know, interacting with and we keep on, um, that we pass down from generation to generation are what has created such a huge class divide. And I think that when we think about binary and we think about, you know, bipartisanship, you know, uh, black, white, uh, you know, male, female, uh, you know, Muslim, Christian, we are sort of failing to see how those exact things are put in place such that we're just we just stay on the bottom man well i mean it's fine to say that they're put in place but we have to see that we're employing them right right oh yeah yeah i mean the culpability is the responsibility is just as much as it is on ourselves as the quote-unquote man in the high tower like we fall prey to employing these stories and these binaries and we are just as culpable and to act like the responsibility is not ours is problematic. We need to own that. And that's what's cool about this conversation is we're seeing all these intersections of the said binary, the be- said story as I went fucking monologue about. <laughs> but we are the ones as individuals, as you and me and everyone listening, it's uh, it's up to us. We got to start... Right, listening with smart ears and looking with smart eyes and seeing the binary and seeing the mass and seeing the stories and start thinking smartly and living creatively and getting excited about living a new story. I just, you know, I'm grateful to be here. I'm, I'm very inspired by the work that people are doing these days to give voice to people who wouldn't normally have it. I'm really inspired by... The work that people are doing every day to, like, without thanks, really, right? I mean, they're just doing it because, you know, people like, you know, like Hudson Taylor, people like Alejo Rodriguez, you know, who who have come on the show and talked about their unique experiences, making sure that people have the space. People are supported, you know? And a lot of those people are men, a lot of people, of oh, those people are, and you know, Yuval Moses, right? And that, and I, I just, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful that we can foster this conversation. And um, I just impress upon you to be somebody around whom this kind of compassion and support can also occur. Thank you for listening. Uh, we hope that, you know, you will share this conversation with your friends and think about the ways that you can be a source of compassion and support in the world today because lord knows we need it um where can we find where can you find us masculinity pod with a k always at twitter and uh at masculinity podcast on facebook our email is masculinity podcast at who is theo.com um my name is samantha zessi my name is roy george philp the first and this has been masculinity thank you for listening Peace. Ciao.